for what is Lucirigari most famous? The publication of Ira Gares, 1932, Doctoral Thesis, Speculum of the Other Woman. 1974, led to her expulsion from further study at Lakin's Freudian School at Vincennes. In Europe a PhD is not sufficient for university teaching. As it is in the United States, and a second dissertation or habilitation is required. Ira Gary's dissertation consisted of her theoretical analyses of a lecture by Sigmund Freud. 1856-1939, on femininity and long quotations from the works of male philosophers, from Plato. C-428 C-348 BCE, to Hegel, 1770-1831. It was evident in the work that by a speculum. She was referring to the concave mirrored medical instrument inserted into a woman's body. What is materialism? In a general philosophical sense, materialism is the doctrine that only physical, material things are real. In a political Marxist sense, Materialism is the doctrine that economic conditions and transactions determine the course of history. How did Islam contribute to Christian European philosophy? Muslim, Christian, and Jewish scholars worked cooperatively in the Spanish libraries, established by Muslims. That were important centers of learning, as well as locations for book collections. The greatest achievement was the rediscovery and translation of ancient Greek texts done first by Islamic scholars. Aristotle was resurrected and became the fulcrum of scholastic educational activity. During the same time, both Islamic and Jewish thinkers became known to European philosophers, who respected them highly. What is philosophy of film? Film criticism, both scholarly and popular, has a history as long as visual media. But philosophy of film, as a contemporary subfield in aesthetics, or philosophy of art, dates from the 1970s. As in other fields, the philosophy of film is similar to the Theory of film undertaken by specialists in film or film studies. There are philosophers who, like film theorists and critics, specifically study film as a self-contained medium. Philosophical cultural critics who use film as evidence of broad beliefs in contemporary culture. And philosophers who turn to film for examples in ethics, aesthetics. Political philosophy, feminism, and many other philosophical interests and subfields. As well, some films directly raise philosophical questions, such as the questions about what is real in The Matrix, 1999, and its sequels, and the nature of memory and identity raised by Memento.
2000, and the children's film The Never-Ending Story, 1984. There are, moreover, films that are directly about philosophy and philosophers such as the Easter. 2004, which is about Martin Heidegger, 1889-1976. Contemporary sources on philosophy and film include, Richard Allen and Murray Smith, editors. Film Theory and Philosophy, 1997, Gregory Curry, Image and Mind, Film, Philosophy and Cognitive Science. 1995, and Cynthia A. Freeland and Thomas E. Wartenberg, Philosophy and Film, 1995. The online journal Film Philosophy, a philosophical review of film studies and World Cinema is an ongoing source of contemporary work and additional sources. Who was Gottlob Frege? Gottlob Freya, 1848-1925, was a professor of mathematics at the University of Jena, who thought that Immanuel Kant. 1724-1804, was mistaken in claiming that mathematical truth is synthetic that is, about reality. Kant had claimed that mathematical truths were synthetic a priori. Which is to say both true of the world and known independently of experience of the world. His task was to show how the concepts of mathematics could be defined in terms of logic alone. So that the theorems of mathematics would then appear as logical truths. If mathematics could be reduced to logic in this way, it would be shown that mathematics was merely true by definition. Meaning that it had no empirical content, so that it could not be about the world. Mathematics would thereby be a priori, but not also synthetic, as Kant had insisted. Who was Hilary Putnam? Hilary Putnam's, 1926, extraordinarily productive career has encompassed metaphysics, epistemology, philosophy of mathematics, philosophy of mind, and philosophy of language. He began to flourish in the philosophical generation after W. V. Oquine, 1908-2000. Becoming a professor at Harvard in 1965, he collaborated with Quine on the ontology of mathematical entities and agreed with him about the analytic-synthetic distinction. In collaboration with his wife, Ruth Anna Jacobs, he helped revive late 20th century interest in the work of John Dewey, 1859-1952. Putnam has also revived interest in William James, 1842-1910, work. Putnam's major publications include Mathematics, Matter, and Method, Philosophical Papers. Volume 1 1975, 2nd ed. 1985, Mind, Language, and Reality, Philosophical Papers, Volume 2, 1975, Meaning and the Moral Sciences, 1978, Reason, Truth, and History, 1981, Realism and Reason, Philosophical Papers, Volume 3, 
1983, The Many Faces of Realism, 1987, Representation and Reality. 1988, Renewing Philosophy, 1992, and Pragmatism, An Open Question, 1995. How did Hillary Putnam agree with WVO? What is known about Leibniz's life? Gottfried Leibniz, 1646-1716, was born in Leipzig, Germany. His mother was the daughter of a professor, and his father was a professor. His father died when he was. 6. Leibniz studied philosophy and law at the University of Leipzig, but he was too young to be awarded a doctorate in law when he finished at age 20. He then moved to Altdorf, where he graduated and was offered a professorship that he turned down to become secretary of the Rosicrucian Society in Nuremberg. He then entered the service of Johann Philipp von Schönborn, Elector of Mainz. And during this time he did not produce his own philosophy but mainly wrote histories and biographies for pay. In 1672 Leibniz went to Paris. And after four years he entered the service of Johann Friedrich, Duke of Hanover. When Johann died, he served Ernst August, 1629-1698, Duke of Hanover, and then George Ludwig, who became King George I of Great Britain in 1714. He was commissioned by Ernst August to write the History of the House of Brunswick in 1685. After traveling to Munich, Vienna, and Italy, he showed as part of his commissioned writing assignment, how Brunswick was connected with the House of Este. Leibniz had a close correspondence with Ernst August's wife, Sophie, and her daughter, Sophie Charlotte, who became Queen of Prussia. He became president of the Berlin Society of Sciences in the same city where Sophie Charlotte lived. After her death, her family was not welcoming to him. Perhaps because they had resented his relationship with her while she was alive. Leibniz was continually involved in efforts to promote communication and cooperation in scientific research, both theoretical and practical. He also had hopes that all Christians might unite. He was honored with prestigious government posts in Vienna, 1712-1714. But by the time of his death his royal patrons, and most of the intellectuals who had known him, abandoned him. They did so for several reasons, Isaac Newton was favored in Leibniz's dispute with him. Leibniz no longer had the protection of Sophie Charlotte, and his philosophical work was not popular. Neither the Royal Society nor the Berlin Academy saw fit to honor him after he died. King George I was nearby when his funeral was held but did not deign to attend or send a representative. Leibniz's grave remained unmarked for almost 50 years until a descendant of Sophie Charlotte took up the cause of rehabilitating his memory. While it is not clear how damaging his dispute with Isaac Newton, 1643-1727, over the discovery of the calculus was to his reputation and standing, it evidently proved more harmful to him than it did to Newton. 
Newton had claimed that Leibniz plagiarized his work on the differential calculus. When Leibniz died, he was engaged in writing a religious work about Chinese philosophy and the Leibniz Clark correspondence in which he attacked virtually every aspect of Newton's metaphysical system. Who was Alfred Tarski? Alfred Tarski, 1902-1983, was a logician. Born in Poland, he taught at the University of California at Berkeley from 1942 to 1958. He is famous for his theory of truth that appeared in The Concept of Truth in Formalized Languages, 1933, which appeared in the Polish journal Prace Torzystwe Naka Wigo Warzowskiego, Wigel 3 Nok Mate Matas No Fizesnik, and was translated into English in Logic, Semantics, Metamathematics, papers from 1923 to 1938, 1983. According to Tarski, any theory of truth should imply the truth of T sentences in natural languages. For example, snow is white in English is true if and only if snow is white is a T sentence. It is important to notice that Tarski's theory of truth does not specify what constitutes truth but is rather about how true sentences can be defined. What was Augusta Cohn's positivism? Cohn advocated the use of mathematics for making decisions in ways that still influence statistics and business models today. He believed that our knowledge all comes from observation and asserted that it was impossible to know anything about physical objects that could not be observed. The goal of science was prediction, said Kant, and explanation has the same structure as prediction. He meant by this that a theory that generates predictions about what will happen can also explain what has happened. For example, Suppose our theory is that friction, oxygen, and combustible material will cause fire. From this we can predict that striking a match will result in a flame. And we can also explain why striking the match causes the flame. Kant also thought that imagination should always be kept in check by observation. How were John Stuart Mill's views on women influential? Mill expressed these views at a time when it was fashionable. For educated men to sentimentalize the traditional role of women. Such sentimentalization, for example, can be seen in social thinker and critic John Ruskin Sesame and Lilies. Or English writer and critic Coventry Patmore's poem The Angel in the House. Many religious authorities and political leaders were outraged and shocked by Mill's opinions on this matter. On the other hand, the suffragist movement had already begun in both England and the United States. And the support of a famous philosopher and public figure was perceived to be a great help in the cause. Nonetheless, 
it wasn't until about 50 years after the subjection of women. 1869, was published that women got the vote in both countries. Although the rights mill advocated for women are now largely taken for granted. Some feminists believe that Mill's failure to address the issue of the division of labor within the family rendered his arguments for the liberation of women incomplete, as did his basic assumption that even once liberated, the vast majority of women would still choose to be wives and mothers. And although Mill stressed the personal development of women, he did so more within the context of their traditional roles than in terms of their autonomy as human beings. Who was Bertrand Russell? Arthur William Bertrand III Earl Russell 1872 to 1970, who was known to his friends as Bertie. Is hailed as the founder of analytic philosophy, along with G. E. Moore, 1873 to 1958, and Ludwig Wittgenstein, 1889 to 1951. He studied and lectured at Cambridge University. Losing his position there between 1916 and 1944 because of his pacifist views and activism. He won the Nobel Prize in 1950. His writings on philosophical, political, scientific, and social reform topics are all in beautifully executed prose. Which he was said to have been able to compose from the first draft. Russell is now best known for his failed attempt with Alfred North Whitehead, 1861-1947, to reduce mathematics to logic. His theory of descriptions, his theory of types, and his ruling doctrine that the work of philosophy is to analyze propositions, the meanings of sentences. And that the only propositions worthy of such analysis must have constituents with which we are acquainted, have direct knowledge of. Russell was one of the most productive philosophical authors of all time. He published hundreds of articles and essays and scores of books. Among the most noteworthy are On Denoting, Mind, Volume. 14, 1905, Philosophical Essays, 1910, The Problems of Philosophy, 1912, Principia Mathematica. With Alfred North Whitehead, three volumes, 1910-1913, Why I Am Not a Christian, 1927. A History of Western Philosophy and Its Connection with Political and Social Circumstances from the Earliest Times to the Present Day. 1946, and the Autobiography of Bertrand Russell, 1967-1969. How did Michel Foucault's philosophy develop? Foucault went back to René Descartes, 1596-1650, to show that the designation of insanity was the product of an age that valued reason in a certain form. He thought that medical practice in general required a certain kind of seeing before specific pathologies could be detected. In the order of things, 1966, he argued that part of the development of economics 
science, and linguistics in the 18th and 19th centuries entailed the invention of the idea of man as a universal subject. Man, the universal subject, was supposed to be always the same and always rational. In the Archaeology of Knowledge, 1969, Foucault showed how the sciences themselves are constituted by discourses or background ways of forming and transmitting knowledge. Without prior standards that make scientific knowledge acceptable as knowledge, scientific discoveries would have no importance. For example, if we hear that scientists have discovered a gene that predisposes people to a certain kind of cancer. We accept this as true, because we accept the authority of science. Discipline and Punish, The Origin of the Prison, 1975 Marks the beginning of Foucault's investigation of power. He argued that institutions such as the prison, the army, the factory, and the school wield power through specific techniques in which oppression can coexist with representative democratic political structures. What was Thales' contribution as the first philosopher in Western history? It's not the content of Thales, c. 624 c. 545 BCE, thought that proved to be so important but rather his willingness to boldly think about the whole of physical existence. Thales' home was Miletus, which had strong ties to Egypt. Like the Egyptians, he believed that the earth floated on water and that water or moisture was the primary substance or stuff of the world. Aristotle thought that Thales had been impressed by the importance of water and fluids for life generally. Indeed, Thales seems to have thought that life is present in every part of the universe and that it was divine. Hence, he is said to have remarked, everything is full of gods. Thales' most striking and novel insight was that the movements and qualities of Water could be used to explain the behavior of living things, as well as natural events. The behavior of water was, in that way, a primary moving principle. A primary moving principle was a thing that was responsible for the movement of all other things. At the same time that water was held to be the primary stuff of the universe, What is ethical naturalism? Ethical naturalism holds that goodness is a natural property and that morality can be understood without intuitions, conscience, or religion. What are the major themes in new philosophy? Several factors stand out, a perceived need for philosophy to be relevant to current social concerns. The value of democracy, cultural pluralism, the importance of including women and non-whites who did not fully contribute to a history dominated by white males, and, 
above all. A strong revolt against ideas of objectivity, truth, and the perceived arrogance and hubris of previous philosophers. There is also a desire to make the subject of philosophy. Interesting to new students in a multimedia, electronic age. Was Hegel a political radical or a romantic? Friedrich Hegel was not a radical in his mature writings in which he praised the status quo. But in his youth, perhaps he was. At 18 he began studies at the Stift Theological Seminary in Tübingen. But he was bored by the course of study and sermons. Preferring to read Aristotle, Spinoza, Voltaire, and Rousseau. Nevertheless, he was a good student, earning a PhD by 20 and a theological certificate three years later. His peers called him old man when he accompanied them in hiking, beer drinking, and carousing. They were all excited by the French Revolution. And in 1792 Hegel was called the most enthusiastic speaker of freedom and equality in a student club that was devoted to the study of Plato. Kant, and F. H. Jacobi. Hegel's roommates were the poet. Christian Friedrich Holderlin and the philosopher Friedrich Schelling, 1775-1854. From Holderlin he learned to love the ancient Greeks even more. They all protested against the political and ecclesiastical stasis of Tübingen. On July 14, 1792, Hegel, Holderlin, and Schelling were said to have planted a liberty tree on a meadow near the Tübingen Seminary, although not all biographers think this in fact happened. Hegel was hardly a romantic philosopher, but there was some romantic drama in his life. As he was finishing the Phenomenology of Spirit, 1807, Christina Burkhard informed him that she was pregnant with their child. Ludwig, his illegitimate son, was born in February 1807. He completed the manuscript on the same day Napoleon Bonaparte captured Jena, October 18, 1807, in 18 LL. At the age of 41, he married Marie von Tutcher, who was 20. Marie's aristocratic family was not enthusiastic about the match. Though, and a government official friend had to intervene to negotiate it. During their courtship, Hegel wrote her a romantic poem, which most describe as hackneyed. He referred to his hope of marrying her as an ascension into eternal bliss. How did Derrida explain deconstructionism in his Of Grammatology? Derrida's of Grammatology, 1972, is about the instability of texts. Due to the fact that all writing depends on the meanings readers bring to it, which may change. So that it cannot be claimed that a given piece of writing has a specific and stable meaning. All signs depend on other signs for their meanings. So there is never an ultimate meaning meaning is always deferred. Jacques Derrida, 1930-2004, speaks of Archie writing in this regard. 
which refers to gaps in the meaning of what is sacrosanct. All writing is split between its intention and how a reader understands it. And there is a gap between the writer and the reader. Derrida's description of the reality of writing is meant to be an accurate account of the nature of intellectual life. The imagined presence of a being before whom the intentions and meaning of the philosopher is grasped is the illusion under which philosophers and others have labored for so long. Derrida thought that there was an ambiguity in the spoken word, which made the written word necessary. And he introduced the term difference to write about this difference. If one says difference and difference aloud there is no audible difference between them. The relevant difference can only be expressed in writing. Although we have already seen how meanings are inconclusive in writing. It is this insight about the dynamic nature of meaning against Ferdinand de Saussure's. 1857 to 1913, structuralist view that there is a system of meaning constituted by speech, for which the written word is somewhat secondary if not unnecessary that earned Derrida the label post-structuralist. Beginning in 1968, Derrida criticized the structuralist tradition as moving from center to center in futility. What was Rousseau's life like? Rousseau's life seemed to spin out of control from time to time. Although he found a degree of stability, intellectually, in his writing. He was born in Geneva, Switzerland. In 1712 and always considered himself a citizen of that canton, city-state. His mother died nine days after his birth. His father, an unsuccessful watchmaker, and his aunt raised him. His father was an emotional man, often reading sentimental novels and Plutarch. As a boy, he was subjected to abuse outside the family. In his confessions, Rousseau described the erotic effect of corporal punishment from a pastor's sister. Later, a notary and an engraver, to whom he was apprenticed, abused him. Rousseau left Geneva at the age of 16, and soon met Françoise Louise de Warens, a Catholic noblewoman who became his lover and motivated him to convert to Catholicism. In 1742, he went to Paris to present a new system of musical. Notation to the Academy de Sciences, but his system was rejected. He then became secretary to the French ambassador in Venice, Italy, in 1743, but left within a year after quarreling with him. Back in Paris, he began a lifelong relationship with a seamstress named Therese Levasseur. He met Denis Diderot, 1713-1784, and began contributing articles on music to his encyclopedia. He then submitted an essay for a competition at the Academy of Dijon in answer to the question of whether the arts and sciences had benefited mankind. Rousseau's resounding negative answer was discourse on the arts and sciences. 1750, it won and made him famous. His opera Le Devon du Village was much appreciated by King Louis XV. 
but Rousseau did not get a pension from him because he immediately supported Italian over French music. Rousseau then returned to Geneva and converted back to Calvinism. He wrote the Discourse on Inequality in 1755, which caused an alienation from Diderot and other patrons. Because it claimed that most human inequalities were the result of society. Not nature, Rousseau believed man was born good. But he secured the support of the very rich Duke de Luxembourg. His romantic novel Julie, Oh You La Nouvelle Heloise was a big success and was followed by Of the Social Contract. 1762, also known as Principles of Political Right, and Emile, or, On Education, 1762. All of these writings were critical of established religion and therefore banned in both France and the canton or city-state of Geneva. Rousseau fled arrest in 1762, brought on by the uproar about his political ideas, and after some disorganized travels. Finally, in 1765, prevailed on the hospitality of the very English David Hume, 1711-1776. The latter situation did not work out, however. Rousseau re-entered France in 1770 under the assumed name Renaud, and went to Paris. He had begun work on the Confessions, in England. But the completed edition was not published until after his death. He wrote considerations on the government of Poland after an invitation to make recommendations for a constitution for the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. This was followed by his Dialoges, Rousseau, 1776, published in 1782. Confessions of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 1782, and Reveries of the Solitary Walker, 1782. He then wrote an analysis of Gluck's opera Alciste, before dying suddenly in 1778. Did Martin Heidegger owe a philosophical debt to Immanuel Kant? Very much so, particularly in his phenomenological analysis of space and time. Like Immanuel Kant, 1724-1804, Heidegger thought that both space and time were in the subjects as necessary preconditions for experience. But unlike Kant, Heidegger did not believe that space and time were necessary categories in the mind. Rather, they were ontological structures of human existence that became evident in the way Dossian concretely existed. Was Alexius Menung serious about non-existent objects? Yes, and it cost his reputation dearly, because Bertrand Russell 1872-1970, was to make great fun of him for it in his famous article on denoting, 1905. Still, other 20th-century philosophers, such as Terence Parsons, 1939, and Roderick Chisholm, 1916-1999, were to defend the consistency of Menung's 
ontology and the usefulness of being able to talk about non-existent objects. Menung believed that non-existent objects include the merely possible, as well as the impossible. He thought that existence was just a property of objects, like smell, or shape. So that, for example, fictional characters lack that property, while Menung himself had it. How did René Descartes' philosophical work begin? On November 10, 1619, Descartes spent many hours sequestered in a room-sized stove in a town in southern Germany. Such very large stoves with shelves, places to sleep, and room to stand up in them were built in Germany and Russia, until the end of the 19th century. Descartes had an epiphany as the result of three bizarre dreams, which set him on a course to create a new system for science and philosophy. His inspiration was that, beginning with a few ideas known to be absolutely true, and careful methods of reasoning with them, the basic principles of all of the sciences could be logically derived from those ideas. Descartes would go on to live briefly in Paris in 1628, before moving to Holland, where he was to remain for the rest of his life. What were William Wool's main ideas? Wool posited certain fundamental ideas, such as space, time, cause, and resemblance, which enabled unconscious inference so that we could structure and relate our sensations in ways that resulted in our perceptions of objects. He thought that each science has a distinct particular fundamental idea that makes sense of its subject matter. For instance, the idea of space for geometry, cause for mechanics, and substance for chemistry. The fundamental idea of a science can be further modified to fit the requirements of that science. Such as the idea of force as a modification of the idea of cause in mechanics. Were all 18th century thinkers in agreement with Enlightenment themes? No. As a counter-tradition to the general rational spirit of the Enlightenment were the Romantics, such as the writers Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, Johann Gottfried Herder, Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, Friedrich Schiller, and William Wordsworth. There were also those, generally referred to as the pessimists of the Enlightenment, who did not subscribe to the belief in progress characteristic of the age. For example, in philosophy, Guy M. Battista Vico, Edmund Burke, and Joseph Marie de Maistre, and in letters, William Cooper, Coderlos de Laxlos, the Marquis de Sada, and Jonathan Swift. Which of the other Enlightenment thinkers were most directly relevant to philosophy?
Among the other Enlightenment thinkers of note in the area of philosophy is Mary Wollstonecraft. 1759-1797, the mother of Frankenstein novelist Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. She contributed the foundations for feminist thought. Her husband was anarchist and political philosopher William Godwin. 1756-1836, known for his determinist utilitarianism. The French philosophes, particularly the encyclopedists, contributed radical ideas about society and government. Voltaire, François-Marie Arouet, 1694-1778, brought key philosophical ideas to a wider audience. Enlightenment thought in general had a powerful effect on the American. Colonies and the Establishing Principles of the United States of America What did William Wool mean by the sensationalistic school? Wool meant to belittle the view of empiricists who held that all knowledge was the result of sensory experience. Or what Wool thought was mere sensation. What are some key facts about Charles Pierce's career and life? Charles Sanders Pierce, 1839-1914, was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts. His father, Benjamin, was professor of mathematics at Harvard University and a founder of the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey and the Smithsonian Institution. Benjamin Pierce is also said to have built the Harvard Department of Mathematics. At the age of 12, young Charles discovered logic, and at 16, he began his independent study of philosophy. In 1859 he graduated from Harvard, unsure of what I would do in life. His primary interest was in logic, for which there were no career opportunities. He practiced geodesy for several years and returned to Harvard to study natural history and philosophy in 1861. He got a Ph.D. in chemistry in 1863, graduating summa cum laude. Pierce continued his studies of logic on his own and has been considered to be one of the greatest logicians of all times. Although he disagreed with Immanuel Kant's 1724-1804, insistence that space was Euclidean and later moved to Friedrich Hegel's 1770-1831, objective idealism. Kant remained a dominating influence over his philosophical ideas. Pierce's philosophy was a distinct form of pragmatism, which he called pragmaticism. Did Malbranche lead an exciting life? If he did, it was in his inner life. To all outward appearances, Nicholas Malebranche was a scholar with the temperament of a religious recluse. He was born and died in Paris and throughout his life like solitude. Malebranche was sickly as a child, born with a deformed spine and prone to respiratory problems. 
he was educated at home by a tutor until the age of 16. His father, Nicholas, was a royal counselor who managed the finances of five farms. His mother was sister to the Viceroy of Canada. Malebranche entered the Collège de la Marche of the University of Paris, receiving an MA in two years. After which he studied theology at the Sorbonne in Paris for another three years. He was ordained as a priest in 1665 at Faubourg St. Jacques. His family contributed to his support by the church. And he had no official duties beyond teaching mathematics in 1674. In 1690 the Church put his trait de la nature et de la grace, 1680, on the index of books that Catholics were forbidden by the Church to read because his claim that all of our ideas are in God was controversial and because he'd been successful in spreading Rene Descartes, 1596 1650, mathematics. Descartes' writings were on the Church's index of forbidden books. So Catholics were forbidden to read them and they could not be taught in church schools. Although his most important work, The Search After Truth, 1674, won him wide acclaim, his students, such as Gottfried Leibniz, 1646-1716, were considered of greater ability, Malebranche encouraged their research. In 1871, Alexander Campbell Fraser, a biographer of philosophers, wrote this account of how the young philosopher George Berkeley, 1685-1783, was the occasional cause of the death of Malebranche. Berkeley found the ingenious father Malebranque in a cell, cooking. In a small pipkin an earthenware cooking pot that was positioned directly over a flame. A medicine for a disorder with which he was then troubled an inflammation on the lungs. The conversation naturally turned on George Berkeley's, 1685-1783, system of which he had received some knowledge from a translation just published. But the issue of the debate proved tragic to poor Malebranque. In the heat of the disputation, he raised his voice so high and gave way so freely to the natural impetuosity of a man of parts and a Frenchman that he brought on himself a violent increase of his disorder, which carried him off a few days after. How did political events after the decline of Greece change philosophy? The death of Alexander the Great, 356-323 B.C.E., marked the end of the classical period in Greek philosophy. The Greek cities were unable to unify after great losses in the Peloponnesian War. 431-432 the next 800 years marked a period of great instability. As the political and cultural center of Western civilization shifted to Europe. As Rome came to dominate Greece, the uncontested brilliance of the Greeks. Faded into the past. Toward the end of this historical period. Christian thought and practice began to define almost every aspect of civilized life. 
Some pre-Socratic thought particularly the ideas and practices of Pythagoras lived on after the decline of Greece. Plato's work endured in new forms that were compatible with early Christianity. The Hellenistic or Greek-based forms of the new philosophies of skepticism. Stoicism, Epicureanism, and Cynicism spread throughout the Mediterranean world. There was little awareness of Aristotle's work at the time, although empiricism was easily accepted. What was unusual about Carl Friedrich Gauss' personality? Gauss, 1777-1855, was meticulous, conservative, and did not much enjoy teaching or other disruptions of his work. He did not collaborate or help younger mathematicians. Neither did he appreciate interruptions. It is said that he was once concentrating on a problem when told that his wife was dying. He responded, tell her to wait a moment till I'm done. Was Christianity the only religious influence on philosophy after the ancient period? No. Although, Christianity formed the dominant worldview in Europe for over a thousand years. Jewish and Muslim thought also flourished. Why was Aquinas called the angelic doctor by Catholics? Thomas Aquinas, 1224-1274, was called the angelic doctor because he believed there were beings with intellectual powers and abilities greater than those of humans. They existed on the highest level of the universe and were purely spiritual. Although finite, they were angels. How do we know the one? Plotinus, 205 to 270, taught that the soul can know the one by becoming one with it. Which he called ecstasy, surrender, simplicity, touching, or flight of the alone to the alone. This reascension of the soul, which has been described as a union with God. In the Christian sense, was experienced many times by Plotinus. To prepare for it, Neoplatonists practiced virtues and Platonic dialectics, which included the study of mathematics. What are some key facts about John Dewey's life and career? Dewey was born in 1859 in Burlington, Vermont, where his father was a grocer. He attended the University of Vermont and then taught classics, science, and algebra at a high school in Oil City, Pennsylvania, and then in Burlington, Vermont. Unsure of his future direction, but encouraged by former teachers. 
He applied to the new graduate program in philosophy at Johns Hopkins University but was turned down for a fellowship twice. Dewey finally borrowed $500 from an aunt to attend. He thereby became part of the first generation able to obtain PhDs in philosophy in the United States. Dewey's teachers at Johns Hopkins were philosophers George Sylvester Morris. 1840-1889, and Charles Sanders Peirce, 1839-1914, and psychologist G. Stanley Hall, 1844-1924. At first, Dewey was very interested in Hegelian ideas of organism, that the living being interacts with its environment. And that society is an organic whole that can be viewed as an organism. After writing a dissertation on Immanuel Kant, 1724-1804, he taught at the University of Michigan from 1884 to 1894. At this time he became interested in public education and progressive politics, as well as psychology. In 1894 Dewey became chair of the Department of Philosophy psychology, and education at the University of Chicago. At Chicago, working with colleagues, he began to develop activist social theories. This resulted in the 1903 Studies in Logical Theory, which was dedicated to William James, 1842-1910. Dewey had a national reputation when he left Chicago for Columbia University. The Journal of Philosophy, published by the Columbia Philosophy Department, became an outlet for his ideas and a forum for discussion of them over the decades. Dewey lectured in Tokyo, Peking, and Nanking, and studied education in Turkey, Mexico, and Russia. In retirement, Dewey chaired the 1937 Mexican Commission investigating charges against Russian revolutionary Leon Trotsky, which produced a report, Not Guilty. He also defended Bertrand Russell in 1941, when Russell was denied a teaching opportunity at City College, New York, because of his political ideas. Who was Moritz Schlick? Moritz Schlick, 1882-1936, is famous for claiming that philosophy was dependent on science, intellectually. He was a philosopher who studied with the physicist Max Planck before arriving in Vienna, Austria, in 1922. His presence was the inspiration for the mathematician Hans Hahn. To inaugurate the discussion group of the Vienna Circle, which, in addition to Hahn and Schlick, at first contained Otto Neuroth, 1882 to 1945, and the physicist Philip Frank, Rudolf Carnap, 1891 to 1970, joined them in 1926. Schlick was professor of the philosophy. Of inductive sciences at the University of Vienna, while he led the Vienna Circle. He believed that empirical knowledge was not about the content of experience, which could not be communicated, but about the form of experience. He maintained that all genuine philosophical problems and questions were either mathematical or logical or could be solved by scientific investigation. 
Schlick believed that this implied that philosophy had no subject matter of its own that was distinct from the sciences. However, unlike other logical positivists, he thought that ethics were practical and that moral goodness was simply whatever is approved by society. Moral obligation could be studied as what is generally required by society. His main works include General Theory of Knowledge. Second edition, 1925, and Problems of Ethics, translated, 1939. What is Marxism? Marxism is the doctrine attributed to Karl Marx, 1818-1883. That human society is divided into social classes and that the material or economic struggles among classes are the most important events on the big stage of history. Are all philosophical feminists women? By no means. A number of male philosophers have endeavored to both learn and support feminism and include feminist subjects in their own more traditional work. These men have published such books as Philosophical Explorations in Light of Feminism, 1992. Edited by Larry May and Robert Strykwerda, Men Doing Feminism, 1998 edited by Tom Digby, and Michael A. Sloat's The Ethics of Care and Empathy, 2007. There were women separatist social movements in the 1970s. But this has never been a viable option in academia. The radical feminist philosopher of religion Mary Daly, 1936, who taught at Boston College for 33 years, was forced to retire in 1999 for barring men from some of her classes. Daly was always on thin ice at this Jesuit institution. Especially after the publication of her first book, The Church and the Second Sex, 1968. Daly's work is about how men have appropriated the roles and power of women in religion, particularly in Catholic ritual. Philosophical feminism has evinced strong support for lesbian feminism on the grounds that lesbians have been oppressed in society and that lesbians may recognize the personhood of women more easily than men. Nevertheless, freedom of sexual preference entails that heterosexuality remains a respected preference. Just as freedom of choice in abortion has not led feminists to invalidate. On moral or political grounds, pregnancy and childbirth. On motherhood, for example, Sarah Ruddick's maternal thinking. Toward a Politics of Peace, 1990, shows how childcare develops distinctive ways of thinking. Although childbirth and rearing is not limited to heterosexual women, much of French feminist writing assumes strong male female sexual differences. Who was Simone de Beauvoir?
Simone de Beauvoir, 1908-1986, is now most famous as the philosopher who began the second wave of feminism in the West. She began writing when she was eight years old and was a novelist and political writer who helped Jean-Paul Sartre, 1905-1980, her main lifelong companion, found L. E. Mont. De Beauvoir's major works include the novels She Came to Stay, 1943. The Blood of Others, 1945, and The Mandarins, 1954, and her philosophical texts The Ethics of Ambiguity. 1947, The Second Sex, 1949, and Old Age, 1970. She also wrote evocative autobiographical works, such as Memoirs of a Dutiful Daughter, 1958. De Beauvoir ruthlessly described Sartre's great decline toward the end of his life in Adieu. A Farewell to Sartre, 1981 Beauvoir also quarreled fiercely with Arlette Elkham, the young Jewish Algerian student who had contacted Sartre when she was 18. Sartre enjoyed discussing his philosophy with Elkham. And he preferred to write in her apartment, instead of following his lifetime habit of writing in cafes. Then he adopted her and bought her a house in the south of France, which became their summer vacation home. Beauvoir had an adopted daughter of her own, Sylvie L. E. Bonne de Beauvoir, with whom she had had an erotic relationship, although Sylvie later described it as platonic. Sylvie wrote Tete et Tete, 2005, about de Beauvoir and Sartre. In 2005, Sylvie and Sartre's daughter were not on speaking terms, each in her 60s. They continued to bitterly contest their respective rights to Sartre and de Beauvoir's literary properties. Since Sartre and de Beauvoir are inextricably linked through letters in which they discussed each other. The complexity of the dispute between their literary air essays can only be imagined. By 2005, Sylvie was a retired philosophy teacher and Arlette was described as extremely reclusive. Geographically, these women had lived close to each other in the same Parisian arrondissement, for some years. Beauvoir had a high tolerance for alcohol all her life. She liked its taste but drank more heavily in her later years. She was also hooked on amphetamines. When she died in 1986, she was buried in Sartre's grave, thereby sealing their link for posterity. Who were the philosophical rationalists? The philosophical rationalists believed that there was a priori knowledge about the world or general truths about the world known by the mind, without experience. This was in contrast to the empiricist insistence that all of our knowledge about the world was based on experience, sensory information in particular. The 17th century philosophical rationalists, such as Rene Descartes, 1596 to 1650, were opposed to the intellectual methods of the empiricists, but they still took science into account in their philosophies. Descartes was actively involved in scientific exploration 
and experimentation throughout his philosophical career. In the late 18th century, David Hume's 1711 to 1776 empiricism posed a special problem for Immanuel Kant. 1724 to 1804, because Hume, 1711 to 1776 applied skepticism to basic beliefs that many had taken for granted before him. Such as the existence of God and the powers of natural causes to bring about their effects. In the 19th century, modern reactions against empiricism took hold in the work of George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, 17701831, Friedrich Nietzsche, 1844 to 1900 and early existentialist philosophers such as Søren Kierkegaard 1813 to 1855 these reactions shared a concern for the validity of a priori truths and religious knowledge What was Philippa Foote's contribution to virtue ethics? Philippa Ruth Foote, 1920, who is the granddaughter of you. S. President Grover Cleveland opposes subjectivism or emotivism in Ethics and insists on a connection between morality and rationality. She has tried to undermine a fact-slash-value divide in claiming that Moral judgments are determined by facts about our lives and nature. In this sense, she is a moral naturalist. Moral naturalism is the view that what is morally good is not some distinct and special quality but ordinary things and actions that have been rationally chosen as best in a particular set of circumstances. Overall, Foot has consistently supported virtues as conducive to self-interest. Her main publications are Virtues and Vices and Other Essays in Moral Philosophy, 1978 Natural Goodness, 2001, and Moral Dilemmas, and Other Topics in Moral Philosophy, 2002 Was Copernicus' new theory purely scientific? No, because there was considerable mysticism in his astronomical ideas. Consider these two passages from his De Revolutionibus Orbium Coelesium Libri 4. Finally we shall place the Son himself at the center of the universe. All this is suggested by the systematic procession of events and the harmony of the whole universe. If only we face the facts, as they say, with both eyes open. And, at rest, however, in the middle of everything is the sun. What is the romantic story involving Peter Abelard and Aloise? The story of Peter Abelard, 1079-1149 And Aloise chronicles one of the most poignant romantic relationships in the Western tradition. It was referred to in the 1999 movie about a doorway that leads into the head of the actor John Malkovich. Being John Malkovich in which John Cusack's character refers.
to Peter and Heloise in the salacious dialogue of one of his marionette shows. Well before this movie, Cole Porter wrote. As Abelard said to Eloise, don't forget to drop a line to me, please. In real life, Eloise had written to Abelard, the name of wife may seem more sacred or more worthy. But sweeter to me will always be the word lover, or, if you will permit me, that of concubine or whore. Abelard, at the peak of his fame and popularity, assumed the position of tutor to Eloise. They fell in love, and he is said to have seduced her. She became pregnant, and they were secretly married. Eloise's uncle discovered the whole affair. Claiming to be incensed by the secrecy of their marriage. He publicly denounced Abelard and then had him castrated. Peter himself recounted these events in his autobiographical work, Historia Calamitatum. Abelard told Eloise to become a nun and he himself became a monk. They carried on a correspondence of passionate love letters. Eloise was more enamored of Abelard than he was of her. Although castration was not an unusual punishment for the kind of betrayal of trust committed by Abelard. He was humiliated by his maiming for the rest of his life, and more or less retreated into his studies. Eloise became the highly successful abbess of a convent. Peter and Eloise were eventually buried together. <laughs>